Hills and Valleys is a podcast that uncovers stories from leaders in healthcare, tech, and everything in between. Straight from the heart of Silicon Valley, we give you a look at the good, the bad, and the future, one episode at a time. Brought to you by Petro Medical. Hi, everybody. This is Omar M. Katim, Director of Growth over at Petro Medical, and I'm with Dr. Rahul Kashap, who's an assistant professor over at the Mayo Clinic, who has a lot of interesting work uh, being done in the world of sepsis, and we caught a lot of his, uh, his slides being tweeted out yesterday, so we wanted to get a you know, few minutes of them. So, doctor, thanks for joining us. Can you tell, tell us a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. First of all, thank you so much for this opportunity. I really I admire your work a lot. Uh, I have been at Mayo Clinic for the past 13 years. So I hold an academy rank of assistant professor, as you mentioned. I've done a, quite a bit of research in uh, ICU intensive care, urea, uh, intensive care unit uh, in sepsis, infection, septic shock shock, mechanical ventilation, acute respiratory distress syndrome, nowadays mostly in checklist education, simulation education as well, and we're getting into a little bit machine learning, see how we can improve care for our critically ill patients. So let me ask you, you know, sepsis is definitely one of the black boxes of medicine, and it's it's a very messy and dirt, you know, dirty thing. It's, it's, it's very difficult to pinpoint. What, what drew you towards sepsis? You are absolutely right. There are multiple reasons. First of all, sepsis has been announced as one of the top 10 causes of death, not only globally by WHO, but also hospitalized patient in the U.S. So it is a it is a pressing issue. We uh, In ICU, there's a rule we say, unless otherwise it's ruled out, you think of sepsis in every single patient who comes to ICU. I have personal reasons as well. I lost my grandfather four years ago because of sepsis. And I've done some work before that, but now I'm a little bit passionate about it to see how we can find cures for it, how can we use technology and making sure that there's enough knowledge around science and symptoms. So we're doing quite a bit of work in those areas, but today I'll focus my talk to the abstract and then tweet, or tweet you are uh, talking about. Very nice, very nice. Yeah, and, and as you mentioned before, I mean, what a lot of people don't realize is that sepsis affects millions of people around the world, and even I think the uh, World Health Organization stated that it's technically at a point of a global crisis right now. So what happens if we don't find ways to innovate and develop technologies to solve for this problem? Take us a little bit deeper into the valley of what that could look like, and don't be afraid to get a little dark on this. Absolutely. Well, let me answer it this way. Not only sepsis, but other syndromes, the, the combination of diseases, and uh, if, like, let's say two or three decades ago, the focus was on defining those syndromes. It may be sepsis, it may be shock, it could be ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, it could be acute kidney injury, and so on and so forth. Then uh, shift changes from, as we have pretty good diagnosis and definitions for them, shift changes from, uh, from diagnosing them to pinpointing when actually these things start. We call them onset time, sepsis onset time, ARDS onset time, and in some uh, tech lingo we call them T0s, uh, when patient shows up at a hospital or when they meet the criteria, especially in sepsis if lactate is high or they have fluid res uh, response, they have uh, low blood pressure in spite of fluid challenges. So that focus is now shifting as we see that we are trying to see, we define them well, we know when they start, can we find out when they resolve and, and patients get recovered out of it. So my work is focused on this, that can we find a recovery point which could be a surrogate marker for not only for our clinical trials, but it can give some arsenal to our physicians to talk to the patients and families where they are at any given point of time, it's 24 hours or 48 hours or 72 hours or, or 7 days from, uh, from ICU admission. And now, when it comes to you know using machine learning, you know, and all the algorithms, you know, you have to have good data and good data that makes sense, right? So there's so many different things that sepsis involves: respiratory rate, uh, urine output, uh, interabdominal pressure. There's all these different things. Core body temperature. How do you decide which parameters to focus on, and, and how how have you sort of narrowed your research down? You are asking a very important question, Omar. There's no easy answer to that. Uh, one rule when we talk in big data era or informatics era, era, we always focus on the quality of the data. That's point number one, because it could be very easy garbage in, garbage out. So not only we have to have a large data set, but we have to pay special attention to make sure that data qualities are really good. So there is no garbage in, garbage out happening. Data can only do good as far as the data is. Are uh, there multiple ways? Uh, the manual data is high quality, but it is it's very less speed. However going back to the question of machine learning piece of it and how many, what variables we need to define or focus on, uh, there is no rocket science. Question is, uh, the point is that uh, uh, the, the most pertinent data points which has been used in literature in the past and clinically relevant, I think we focus on those data points early enough. Uh, 
computer can give us some really valuable information uh, which we have not think before but we have to think it if how clinically relevant those data points are just an example a difference in systolic blood pressure or total mean atrial pressure of 2 uh, from 74 to 72 could be statistically significant in a larger data set but clinically it might not be that meaningful for that matter now Based on your talk this past week, there was a slide that was, that was tweeted out. What are some of the things that you've seen that have been interesting markers when it comes to predicting sepsis? Because that's really the key. We're great at identifying sepsis, but by then it's too late. So how do we move towards prediction? So prediction of sepsis, uh, there's a lot of work being done as well. My, I focused on areas and how can, can we predict the recovery of sepsis from it. So let's say at the end of uh, 24 hours or 48 hours, some of the values like uh, use of vasopressors, the doses of vasopressors, or lactate values from 2.9 to 2.1. If there is still high values and you're requiring more of those amount at cutoffs of 2, 6, 24, and 48 hours, that can give you a pretty good prediction saying, you know, these patients are sick, they are likely to not do well, or versus the patients who are actually don't have those values or lower than that, those patients are likely to recover well. The, I'll go back to my early point there when I said that if we target those, those, those areas and those surrogate markers for sepsis recovery, I think we can uh, come up with the, not only the technological but drug uh, discoveries as well rather than focusing on the uh, mortality in ICU and for that matter. And so in terms of not focusing on the mortality in the ICU around sepsis, what kind of, I mean if you had a magic wand, what kind of drugs would you want to have in your arsenal to, to combat this? Let me not answer this question and give you this alternate answer for that is that we are a strong believer that we may not need at this point a new medication or new device to treat it. The implementation of existing knowledge is so low at this point. We are focusing our, 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 our in interventions are can we imply already existing knowledge to the T so people and patient get benefited. And we have proven it in, I, I'll do a shameless plug for other projects we have done. It is called Certain Project, which is a global project we looked at. And we just looked at a checklist use of implementation of the best practice guidelines around the world in 42 ICUs in 20 countries. And that another work was presented and today will be awarded in a couple of hours uh, that we were able to not only improve the process of care, but reduce the mortality around the world as well. So coming back to the point is, I'm not here to define, design or discover new medications or new devices, but using of technology, can we implement already existing knowledge to the T so everybody is getting standard of care uh, no matter where you are in the world? Interesting. Do you feel like this is a, a challenge? Because I keep hearing this from different physicians in different departments that, you know, there, it's really easy for physicians to identify chronic or acute, good versus bad, but there's a lot of gray that's in between and that's where the main intervention needs to be happening, but it doesn't seem to be happening. Would you agree with that statement? So. Uh, if uh, the, you said the question is for acute versus chronic. Uh, yeah, and that there seems to be an, a middle area where a lot of patients fall into where they're not doing good, they're not doing bad, they're in the middle, but no intervention is being done because, you know, for whatever, for, what, for a variety of different reasons. So uh, you're asking a very important question, Omar, and I, I probably I don't have answer for it, but let me say this, uh, that... Uh, the patients who are not too sick to come to hospital but they are too uh, not too healthy to come to hospital or too sick to stay at home or nursing home for that matter I think we are also seeing that uprise and, and that is a dilemma for physicians or healthcare providers for that matter or research scientists for that matter um, the idea is can we predict some of these in between uh, uh, comorbidities first of all and second can we do much in our patients who are getting discharged from hospital so they if they don't go back go back to their baseline but they assume a, a third a third status like they have their healthy status and they their sick state and then they get the third state which is somewhere in between uh, but that that state is making them functioning independently so it's it's a large large piece of work and i don't think so we have a right answers at this point so one last question before we go. So any, you know, uh, I'm sure many people want to be able to follow you to keep up with your work. I think how can they find you online? Well, they should follow you and then uh, this podcast and like it. Uh, I'm on Twitter. I, have, I, I try to tweet uh, uh, publications and our work as well. Uh, uh, we have a Facebook page for our projects. Uh, we are on LinkedIn as well. Uh, uh, my email ID is in public domain as well, uh, but I'll be happy to connect it through email or uh, send me a tweet uh, at uh, dr underscore s-r-k-a-s-h-y-a-p or Rahul Cash up uh, at LinkedIn or Facebook uh, for that matter or Instagram if you have uh, followers there. Perfect. Doctor, thank you so much for taking some time with us. Absolutely. It's a pleasure.